Hi, everyone. How are you? Good. I figured I'd start at the beginning. I'll, I'll tell you some of the earliest memories of my life. I come from kind of a strange household. I was raised in a deaf household. Uh, both my parents are really into hip hop. Um, <laughs> strange having deaf parents. You know, my mom growing up would need to call me on the telephone, but she couldn't use a regular phone. So what she would have to do is type a message on a computer. The message would then go to an operator. The operator would then call me, and that's whose voice I would hear on the telephone which made for some awkward conversations. Like, Ring, hello. Hello, my son. God? <laughs> no, no, it's your mama calling. How are you, my beautiful boy? Mom, are you a black dude? <laughs> and she was, my mom was a black dude, which was difficult for me, difficult for my father too, he was very upset when he found out it was a great bait and switch, which was why I think perhaps they divorced when I was very young and my mother moved me to Oakland. My father stayed in Brooklyn and by the time my father won visitation rights, I flew back to Brooklyn to find that in my absence, my father had joined up with a group of Hasidic Jews known as the Satmar Hasidim, who are the most weird of all the Hasidic groups. <laughs> Let me say that again so that you'll understand me. Of all the Amish bearded gown and fur hat wearing people from the past, my father joined up with the group that was the most outside the margins of society. This would be like being among the fattest of all Walmart shoppers. It's a very intense level. And I would go back into the old country. My father would pick me up at the airport, drive me to the Hasidic Jewish barber shop, which is much different than the black barber shop, I promise you. And he would push me in front of a man who would say, where are your payas? The payas, of course, are the dangly side locks that Hasidic Jews enjoy. I guess God is very into that. I don't know exactly why. God's like, I don't get it myself. I created the whole universe, but I just love a little curl. I can't get over it. Bang, 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 bang. <laughs> So then my father would put a yarmulke on me and a dress shirt and take me to Seagate where I would then to be a Hasidic Jew for six weeks a year. I would sort of shuck and jive, be like, mammy, I hope that nobody noticed. I didn't notice what, I didn't know what I was doing in the old country. Here's how you get to Seagate. If you take the F train to the last possible stop in Brooklyn, you get off, walk past Coney Island, past the projects, past the people of color, through a gate, through a time portal to pre-Nazi Europe. <laughs> You will then arrive in Seagate where people are still using horse-drawn buggy and spitting at redheads because they're bad luck. It's an intense place to be. <laughs> Years went by and it was about to be my bar mitzvah. And you know how Jews have fun themes to their bar mitzvahs? You know, like uh, the Yankees or Indiana Jones and a Harrison Ford look-alike will pop out of a cake and whip a pinata with a whip and a waterfall of golden chocolate coins will spill out. By the way, am I the only person that's disturbed by the idea of the golden chocolate coin as the go-to celebratory snack of the Jewish people? <laughs> Are we not concerned with our reputation as Shylocks and money grubbers at all? <laughs> what are the Gentiles supposed to think when they see us training our children to actually eat money? <laughs> nah, 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 I like it so much, Daddy. <laughs> anyway, the theme to my bar mitzvah was the Holocaust. It was a dreary affair. I walked in, I knew no one at my own bar mitzvah. It was just people from Seagate and the set of Yentl who'd been hired to come play the part <laughs> of my friends and family and I knew no one, but I did know that they all were giving me checks at the bar mitzvah, which was very exciting. I was just stuffing money in my pocket and at the end of my bar mitzvah, I had $1,500, which was more money than I'd ever seen in my life and I was so excited. I should also tell you though that I was a 13-year-old boy and I'd recently learned how to do the things that 13-year-old boys do all right, masturbate, this is what I'm talking about. Do you remember when you first learned to masturbate when you were just like, oh, okay, goodbye, everybody. <laughs> I'll see you in a couple of years. And at first I didn't even know there was an end game, you know what I mean? I would just do it for a while, pack it back in, be like, that'll do, pig, and get on with my day. <laughs> and then the fateful day came. So here's what I started to do. I started calling phone sex lines when my Hasidic deaf Jewish family would go to sleep. I would sneak down, this literally, I would sneak like a little creature downstairs and call these phone sex lines. And I would call these third world nations. You remember they had the 900 numbers and then every number got blocked and then they started this long distance arrangement with these third world countries where you could call, there would be a $20 connection fee and you could you know, call up and you can't use your real voice. You can't be like, hi, it's almost my bar mitzvah. You have to be like, hi, it's me, Jim, and this is totally normal. So here's the best call I ever made. I called, I think, a place in the Philippines, 
She picked up, she was like, Allo, I don't do voices, so it'll sound like a Russian man, but it was a Filipino woman. <laughs> she's like, Allo, and I was like, hi, it's me, Jim, ready for this action, let's do this. And she's like, oh no, sorry, I don't do that kind of call. Now the only response at this point is to immediately hang up the phone, maybe call a different number, maybe give up entirely. No, I decided to push the issue for some reason. I was like, what do you mean you don't do this kind of call? Come on, and she's like, no, no, I don't do it. And I was like, come on, please. And she was like, oh, all right. <laughs> and we did it. What happened in that moment? What, I still think about that. Did, what was that? Did I pull a woman out of retirement for one last moan? Or even more compelling, did I call a random wrong number in the Philippines <laughs> and some blessed saint of a woman was like, he seemed like he's got some problems right now. Go ahead, you can do it. <laughs> then the phone bill came and it was $1,500. I spent every cent of my bar mitzvah money directly on my penis. And that's how I became a man. Thanks guys. Moshe Kasher. What do you want me? All right. <laughs> I'm still here, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Moshe. Thank you. Thanks for having me. What a pleasure. Well, uh, the book is um, the book is hilarious and dark and. Uh, Genius. It's really fantastic. I wanted to say genius. Thank I you. did want to say genius. I'm glad you said it for me. Um, <laughs> I, but I did want to talk about this culture clash, and you, and you talked about it a little bit. So you talked about sort of what, what life was like at your dad's, but you were going from Oakland with your hippie mom to this situation with your Hasidic father, and it, you, would sp you would spend summers with your dad. So what was that like for you? What was that transition like for you? Oh, it was literally like going back in time. I mean, it's a strange, I don't know if you know Oakland, everybody, but I don't read particularly Oakland. I don't know if you can see the look, but I, I, would, uh, I would essentially fly back in time and I would go into the old country and I would try to be invisible. I would try to make sure that nobody noticed that. I, I mean, I have family that are third generation American who still speak with Eastern European accents. I am not exaggerating. I could be like, they're like New Yorkers, and I could be like, yay, go Yankees. And they'd be like, uh, was is the Yankees? They don't, <laughs> that's the level we're operating at. But if I was like, what's tractate 15 in the Talmud, they'd be like, uh, whatever thing. I don't speak Yiddish still. Yeah, well, but it also must have been hard going back the other way after you'd been trying to assimilate into that, in, into the Hasidic culture. Well, because yeah. You, yeah, I mean, you were, you were fairly different in some of the, in, in, in your situation in Oakland as well. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you, here's the ultimate example of how bifurcated my existence was. What, what, if you had asked me when I was a kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would have said, I want to be either a baseball player or a famous rabbi. Uh, I didn't want to be either of those things. They just filled in some deficit that I imagined I had, you know, uh, you know, baseball for my manhood, Torah for my soul, and in reality, I didn't have much of either. And so that middle place yeah. is where I jumped into and found a lot of trouble. You did find a lot of trouble, and um, you you got in a lot of trouble. And and but but the thing was that mo that both of your parents were deaf, and so you would go into a parent-teacher conference, and you were the actual uh, person who was uh, translating this for your mother. So how did that work? Yeah, that's right. I mean, in some sort of inane logic flaw, I would be uh, assigned to be the interpreter for the disciplinary meeting that I was also the subject of. <laughs> and so you become really adept at kind of massaging the message, you know what I mean? Like, you're not gonna, you can't just be like, we think this kid's great, he's a genius, he might write a book someday called Casher in the Rye, <laughs> because then they'll notice that there's something wrong in the air. My mom would have said, they're not smiling when they say that. So I would sort of nuance it, you know? They would say like, he's a terrible kid and we think he's awful, and I would say, he's a very interesting child and thinks in a way that is different from his peers or things like that, until my mom would walk out of these parent-teacher conferences talking about how very paranoid and weird the people at Oakland Public Schools were. <laughs> Right. Well, and you also, I mean, it, it was obviously a different environment from where you went with your dad. You listened to a lot of Too Short, uh, a, a you rapper. You guys a big Too Short crowd? Um, <laughs> yeah, right. His, if you're not, his songs include uh, Call Her a Bitch, Broke Bitch, and All My Bitches Are Gone. And I'm wondering... No, that's when... Gloria Steinem, I think. <laughs> 
Well, when you listen to music, how, how did this affect your relationships with women, with the ladies? Well, let me put a pin in that and just say, uh, as a seven, eight, nine-year-old in Oakland who's listening to horrible misogynistic songs like that, it really helps to have a deaf mother. Let me, I'll just say, <laughs> you could not imagine how many times we would be driving along just blaring too short and these awful messages as my mom kind of happily puttered along, <laughs> turning to us and signing, I love this stuff, I can feel the bass. Um, but how did it affect my relationship with women? I mean, look, I, I was raised in a feminist bordering on man-hating household. Uh, the message in my family was essentially all men are pigs, except for you two boys. Uh, and then my, so that's my female role models, and my male role models were too short. I had nobody left not to hate. I was stuck <laughs> once again in this middle place, and I, uh, I found an escape hatch, I think, at the bottom of the well. Yeah. Well, and you found yourself in, you know, in schools uh, try, where they tried to discipline you. You found yourself in rehab. And it was interesting in the book to see that you, uh, you, you seem to derive so much pleasure from aggravating adults to the point that they would lose control with you. And, and it's interesting because when you, when you do your stand-up, you seem to sort of like to, to sort of to, to, to figure out where that line is and maybe step over it a little bit. Do you feel like that some of that comes from back when you were a kid? That's a really interesting question. I, I agree. You know, I, my, my sweet spot is right in the, ed, is the zone where the audience can't decide if they love me or hate me. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's exactly where I, where, I, where I sort of thrive. And I think that I found a way to thrive in that zone. Uh, no, there, that wasn't the zone. I hated adults. I mean, I hated adults. So It's very unfortunate that if you hate adults and you don't die, you eventually become an adult, which has <laughs> been an extremely disconcerting process as my chest hair turns gray. I'll show anybody that's interested after the show. Um, I took a great pleasure in, you know, being in a therapy session or a rehab session or a severely emotionally disturbed student school session. That was literally the designation of the schools that I went to, severely emotionally disturbed schools, which are even less pleasant that you, than they sound. They were essentially elementary schools and high schools with padded cells in the back of the room. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing more disturbing to a lecture on the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria than the low, deep thudding of a severely emotionally disturbed child's head on the padded cell wall. That child, I think, was left behind. Um, <laughs> But I would take a great pleasure and I would find a chink in whatever the armor, whatever the, the therapeutic armor of whatever clinician I was dealing with was and sort of stick my little fingers in there and rip it open. And the moment that I made a therapist scream at me, I thought, I won. I finally yeah. got my power back. <laughs> well, and you did. You went through so much as a kid. And do you think that you would be as funny as you are right now if you hadn't have gone through all of that? I think that I learned how to be funny as a way of defending myself. I mean, Oakland Public Schools, if you're a white boy, which I am, you have a few different options of how to survive. You know, you can be invisible, uh, or you can be uh, bad, or you can be funny. And I chose to do a combination of bad and funny, uh, which is the name of my next book. <laughs> <laughs> Would you trade a happier childhood for not being funny now? <laughs> Uh, what's the point of trading? I guess, you, you know what I mean? You get the lot that you get and you gotta play, play the cards that you're dealt and I, I wouldn't trade, I mean, look, look at how funny I am. <laughs> I mean, how could I give that up? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, the book is uh, hilarious and fascinating. Uh, it is Casher in the Rye, the true tale of a white boy from Oakland who became a drug addict, a criminal, mental patient, and then turned 16. The author is Moshe Casher. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, us. guys. Thank you.